Uh, welcome, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we've got two presentations today. One, uh, Bob Elgadelli will be discussing bankruptcy fraud, and then Judge Leno would like to speak about the new uh, Chapter 13 plan. I think the only announcement is that we have the dinner coming up on the 19th of October, so make sure you send your RSVPs back. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynn, and thank all of you for the privilege of presenting to you today. I'm happy to hear that most of you fared okay through the storm. In our profession, nothing is more important than the integrity of the bankruptcy process and the public confidence in the honest administration of the process. Of course, the principal purpose of bankruptcy is to grant a fresh start to honest but unfortunate debtors. However, no one is entitled to a head start. The objectives of bankruptcy law also include providing an equitable distribution to creditors and serving the important interests of the government. These objectives are frustrated when participants in the process engage in honest activity. That's why a number of statutes criminalize bankruptcy fraud. Those statutes can be found at Title 18 of the United States Code, Sections 152, 153, and 157. Despite the seriousness of these bankruptcy crimes, there are only three elements. One, that there is or was a bankruptcy case. Two, knowing and fraudulent prohibited activity, which I'll get back to in a minute. And three, that the asset was property of the estate under the broad definition of property of the estate as we know it. Now, prohibited activity it falls in five categories. One, which is the most prevalent, concealment of assets. Two, oral false oaths, statements, as to a material fact at any type of hearing in a bankruptcy case, or written false oaths or statements as to a material fact under penalty of perjury. Three, filing a false claim against the estate, four, bribery or extortion, and five, concealment, destruction, or withholding of documents related to the property or financial affairs of a debtor. Now, what are the consequences of being convicted of bankruptcy fraud? Uh, one who's convicted can face up to five years imprisonment, can be ordered to serve a term of supervised release, can be ordered to make restitution and pay a fine of up to $250,000. Now, bankruptcy crimes are considered fraud offenses under the sentencing guidelines. Since the sentencing guidelines are advisory, enhancements are possible. For example, where the commission of the offense involves abuse of a position of public or private trust, or required use of a special skill in order to facilitate it or to conceal it, sentencing enhancements are typically imposed. Now, with respect to the elements of bankruptcy fraud, there are some important points. Similar to an actual fraudulent transfer claim, a defendant's knowledge and intent may be ascertained from circumstantial evidence in proving a bankruptcy fraud has occurred. Also, concealment may take the form of omission of assets in their entirety or the gross undervaluation of assets. As we've seen on many bankruptcy schedules, you see a description of property and you see $1 or some nominal amount, you know, in the other column next to it um, in order to perhaps induce a trustee not to look at that further or to, to bypass that. Um, certainly, Ms. Jensen would look at it even closer, and, and all the other trustees, Mr. Tardif and Mr. Rivera. Um, but, you know, the gross undervaluation of assets is also concealment, even if you disclose the asset itself. Also, hinder actions which hinder a trustee's ability to dispose of estate assets constitutes fraudulent concealment. Another thing I wasn't aware of uh, when preparing for this presentation is that the return of a concealed asset or the use of the asset to pay creditors are not defenses to a bankruptcy crime. And this is because one of the evils of bankruptcy fraud is that such acts prevent the court from being the final arbiter of debtor and creditor rights. 
The statute of limitations to charge somebody with a bankruptcy fraud uh, does not begin to run until a concealment is discovered or the debtor is either granted or denied a discharge. Thus, a debtor may be convicted of bankruptcy fraud even though he or she received a discharge. Finally, Section 503B3C of the Bankruptcy Code allows for the reimbursement of creditor expenses as administrative expenses in connection with the prosecution of a criminal offense relating to the case or to the business or property of the debtor. Now, I put on some chairs uh, in this room a criminal bankruptcy fraud referral guide as well as an excellent ABI law review article. I'd encourage uh, you to take them with you today and to review them um, at, at some point. Uh, it's, very, it's an excellent resource, a very good resource. The referral guide was authored by Carolyn Bell, who is the Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Florida, uh, as well as numerous U.S. trustees from around the country. Ms. Bell was one of the criminal bankruptcy, well, I'm sorry, one of the original criminal bankruptcy fraud prosecutors for the department. She helped write Section 157, and her duties included reviewing all referrals, selecting certain referrals for prosecution, and overseeing all prosecutions. In the referral guide, there is a section called Common Fraud Schemes Involving Bankruptcies, and it's described as red flags or common characteristics. And they include bust-outs, bleed-outs, Ponzi schemes, health care and welfare fraud, rent or equity skimming, concealment and false statements, collusive involuntary bankruptcies, straw buyers or fictitious buyers, serial filers, creditor fraud, fraudulent petition mills, and professional fraud. In the interest of time, I will not elaborate on those, um, on those uh, common schemes, but the guide elaborates on them, and um, you know, please take a moment to review them. The guide also includes a summary of 24 bankruptcy fraud warning signs. Uh, if there's any section of the guide you read, I highly encourage you read the summary of 24 bankruptcy fraud warning signs because you've either been involved in a case or you are currently involved in a case where some of those warning signs are present and they may be indicative of something more problematic than, than a mere oversight or uh, a neglect in, in uh, disclosing information. So I want to turn to some real-world examples of, of these statutes in operation and some prosecutions. And I'm going to start in the north, and I'm going to head down south. Um, I was happy to, in preparing for this presentation that fraud, uh, bankruptcy fraud isn't an issue just for Florida. Um, it, is a, it is an issue that is around the country, unfortunately, um, but um, Florida, unfortunately, gets a bad rap sometimes as to where the sort of the state that has all of the fraud. So we're going to start in New Jersey with Teresa Judice. Teresa uh, Judice was the star of the reality show, The Real Housewives of New Jersey. On, in October of 2009, Ms. Judice filed a joint Chapter 7 bankruptcy uh, case with her husband, Giuseppe. And like all debtors, they signed their schedules and state, schedule statements and lists under penalty of perjury. They testified at their meetings of creditors in their 2004 examinations, and their testimony included, among other things, that their bankruptcy filings were true, complete, and correct. Unfortunately for the Judices, their bankruptcy filings and testimony were false and fraudulent. They had not disclosed all of their business ownership interests, their bank accounts, their rental property income, their other income, and anticipated increases in income. With respect to Mrs. Judice, she had received over $100,000 in income from various sources, including her work as an actress on the Real Housewives of New Jersey show, and payments from personal and magazine appearances that she did not disclose. Mrs. Judice also formed a limited liability company in the months leading up to her bankruptcy. And with respect to that company, she had registered a website domain name she had filed a trademark application. Uh, she had sold fashion merchandise through the website. 
on behalf of that limited liability company, and she deposited all the proceeds from the sales into a business bank account. Well, slowly but surely, all of this information was it came to the surface, it was revealed, and because of that, the pressure by the trustee in New Jersey and the U.S. trustee's office, in 2011, the Judices agreed that they would be denied their discharge. Their discharge. So 2011, the rest of the year goes by, 2012 goes by, they're thinking that our troubles are behind us, we're done with this case, um, we've, our discharge has been denied. But on July 29, 2013, the Judices were indicted on 23 counts of bankruptcy fraud. And in addition to the bankruptcy fraud charges, they were charged with conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud, bank fraud, loan application fraud, and failure to make tax returns. Now, um, ultimately, the Judices pled guilty to certain of the counts in the indictment. The bankruptcy case was closed and Ms. Judice was sentenced to a term of imprisonment of 15 years, two years of supervised release, ordered to pay restitution of roughly $414,000, and ordered to pay an $8,000 fine. Well, who do you think Ms. Judice blamed for her bankruptcy problems? Her lawyer. So, um, no good deed goes unpunished sometimes. So. She claimed she had this great professional negligence claim against her bankruptcy lawyer. And so her bankruptcy case was reopened after it had been closed to administer this undisclosed asset or this recently discovered asset. So then a fight ensued as to who owned the malpractice claim. So the judge ordered the parties to mediation. At mediation, the trustee and Ms. Judice agreed on an allocation of any recovery from the malpractice suit. I think 55% was going to the estate and 45% was going to Mr. Judice. Uh, they had filed a 9019 motion. Um, one party objected. I'm sure you can guess who that party was. Um, the judge overruled the bankruptcy attorney's objection, uh, entered an order approving the 9019 motion, and the bankruptcy attorney appealed. So, um, on appeal, um, it, the 9019 order was affirmed in June of this year. But that case is ongoing, and uh, we'll see if the estate gets any of the recovery from the malpractice suit. Next, we're going to go to Pennsylvania, and we're going to talk about Abigail Lee Miller, a name you may recognize as the star of the reality show Dance Moms. Miss Miller filed a Chapter 11 petition in the Western District of Pennsylvania on December 3, 2010. In her petition, she identified her occupation as a dance educator and identified four businesses that were sole proprietorships, sole proprietorships she operated in the same line of business. In her proof of income, she reported that she was self-employed and collected roughly $8,900 per month. Unfortunately for Ms. Miller, she knowingly concealed a substantial amount of business income earned from the reality show and other spin-off programs and uh, income from online merchandise sales similar to Ms. Judas. Uh, after the bankruptcy had been filed, and remember this is a, two, a, a chapter 11 case, after the bankruptcy had been filed, unbeknownst to the trustee, the creditors, and the bankruptcy court, uh, Miss Judice entered into binding contracts with the TV producer to appear in several future episodes of the show for a per episode talent fee of $15,000 and for spin off shows of up to $25,000 per episode. And relying upon this lack of disclosure, she filed, she filed her plans with the bankruptcy court. And in those plans, she denied that any contracts existed for the show, that she was not guaranteed an increase in income from the show for additional seasons, and that the show income was volatile. The plans proposed to restructure her secured debt and proposed a six-year payout to unsecured creditors without post-petition interest. 
Ultimately, in October 2012, her disclosure statement was approved and a confirmation hearing was set for December 20th, 2012. But unfortunately for Ms. Miller, her judge owned a TV <laughs> and was, had, a, had a little free time uh, to watch and to surf the channels uh, that evening and came across an advertisement for Abby's Ultimate Dance Competition. And thought to himself, well, I can't be right, $8,900 a month in income is disclosed, and something's awry here. So the judge entered an order sua sponte on December 13th, canceling the confirmation hearing, ordering Ms. Miller to file a supplement to identify any contracts that she entered into, any income that she received, and future income to be received, related to her involvement in any reality show, whether it was Dance Moms or any spin-off show. So shortly thereafter, the debtor disclosed, Ms. Miller disclosed $288,000 in previously unreported TV show income. She then filed a second amended plan of reorganization and disclosure statement, now proposing to pay general unsecured creditors in full. Well, the court scheduled a status conference shortly afterwards, and I just want to read you a couple of quotes from the transcript of that hearing. <laughs> At the hearing, the judge said, all of a sudden, $288,000 appears in counsel's bank account, amended plans are filed, 100% to unsecured creditors. But back in December, December, we went through a plan confirmation hearing, and there wasn't one word about the new contracts and the monies. And if it wasn't for me channel surfing one night and seeing Abigail Miller's ultimate dance competition on one of the TV stations and how the American Idol with judges and Miss Miller being on TV and then seeing some ads for the maniac is back, I realized that there's an awful lot of money coming into this plan, this case, and it hasn't been disclosed. The judge went on to admonish Miss Miller and he said, this is an honor system. You know, I can't, if it wasn't for me just sitting down and channel surfing one night and coming across it, I would have never thought. I would have just, your, I would have just your original plan ostensibly it would have never been revised, amended, and you would have sought to get the ballots in place. And Miss Miller, you would have $288,000 at least in your pocket that wasn't disclosed to the court. So the judge clearly was not happy. Now, other evidence surfaced in the case that showed that Ms. Miller's um, failure to disclose was intentional. In one of the emails that came to the surface, uh, the subject header was in all capital letters, let's make money and keep me out of jail. <laughs> she also advised the recipient of the email not to raise any red flags and in capital letters, don't put cash in the bank, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Another email, she said to the recipient that she did not want to get paid these large sums until the bankruptcy is over and I can make them out to the S Corp. Well, because Ms. Miller was proposing to pay unsecured creditors in full under her second amended plan, uh, that plan was confirmed on New Year's Eve in 2013, and she received her discharge. Okay. Well, like Mr. and Mrs. Judice, who thought that their troubles were behind them, 2014 goes by, 10 months into 2015 goes by, and a 20-count indictment for bankruptcy fraud is issued charging Ms. Miller with concealing and attempting to conceal income by not reporting or under-reporting actual and projected income from monthly operating reports, attachments, and court filings. And what was interesting is that every time she filed a monthly operating report that contained a false oath or concealed an asset, that's a separate count in the indictment. It's not one count for the, just the bankruptcy case. Every filing is a separate count where there's a false oath and a, a, a concealing of an asset. The indictment alleged that Ms. Miller deposited income into undisclosed accounts, used Florida corporations, so there is a Florida Connections, mm -hmm. to receive income payable to her personally, cash checks at local banks, used nominee bank accounts, as well as PayPal and Square to conceal her income. 
Now, as if Ms. Miller's troubles were not enough while she's under indictment for bankruptcy fraud. She was then charged with, in a new, in, in an information this time, she was charged while under indictment for bankruptcy fraud of transporting for foreign currency from Australia to the United States and failing to report it in on the appropriate form. While well, saying that she probably can't defend these charges, she pleads guilty to them ultimately and is sentenced to 366 days in prison, two years supervised release, order to forfeit $120,000 and to pay a $40,000 fine. So coming to our backyard, the Middle District of Florida, um, on, in, on November 11, 2014, Patricia Regan filed a voluntary Chapter 7 case that was assigned to Judge Williamson. Steve Meininger was appointed the trustee. At her 341 meeting of creditors, Ms. Regan testified that to the best of her knowledge, all of the information in her petition schedules and SOFA were true and, was true and correct, and that she had listed all of her assets and liabilities. The case proceeded in due course. Ultimately, Mr. Meininger uh, issued a report of no distribution. Uh, the debtor received her discharge, and the case was closed. Well, nine months later, Ms. Uh, Ms. Regan filed an affidavit in support of a petition for emergency suspension of her bankruptcy lawyer. In it, she stated that she received $93,000 from a, a tobacco settlement on behalf of her deceased husband and did not want the funds taken from her during her bankruptcy case. So her attorney instructed her to deposit the funds in her trust account six months before the petition date. The debtor subsequently asked for the money to be dispersed post-discharge to her, and the lawyer said, I used it. <laughs> Sorry. Money's, money's gone. So um, she wasn't happy with that, so obviously thought he, the, the lawyer should have an ethics complaint filed against him. And uh, the U.S. trustee shortly afterwards uh, filed a complaint to revoke her discharge. Uh, not surprising that her discharge was revoked. And um, that case is still open, actually. Um, looking for some undisclosed assets or, or for, um, to, to administer some undisclosed assets. As for her bankruptcy lawyer, who actually had an office or an office address here in Fort Myers, uh, he was indicted in December 2016 for concealing assets in contemplation of a bankruptcy case with the intent to defeat the provisions of Title 11 and embezzlement against a bankruptcy estate because he had taken property of the estate and embezzled it. So he had committed that crime against the bankruptcy estate. The lawyer was, uh, had pled guilty and he was sentenced in June for six to six months in prison six months under house arrest, order to make restitution to the bankruptcy estate for the $93,000, order to serve 300 hours of community service, and it was sentenced to a term of a three years supervised release. Uh, now the Southern District, I know you were all waiting for me to get to the Southern District, because right? you know, a lot of things happen in the Southern District. So, um, Lewis Freeman, was a well-liked and highly regarded forensic accountant. Mr. Freeman um, was frequently appointed as a receiver, as a liquidating trustee, as well as an assignee for the benefit of creditors. And when he received these appointments, he would frequently hire his forensic accounting firm to pro provide services to the estate. So there would be a business relationship between his firm and the estate, and there would be a flow of funds between the estate and his forensic accounting firm. Well, in February of 2010, uh, Mr. Freeman was charged with conspiracy to commit mail fraud over a period of nine years. The information alleged that he had misappropriated money for matters on which he was appointed as a fiduciary, that he used the funds for personal purposes, and that he had filed false reports with the courts. Uh, Mr. Freeman pled guilty. He was sentenced to 100 months imprisonment, so a little over eight years three years supervised release in order to pay restitution of about $2.6 million. 
Some of you may also know Marika Tolles. Uh, Marika, very well liked, uh, highly regarded Chapter 7 panel trustee, who also was appointed as a uh, receiver for cases and as personal representative of various estates. In March of 2011, Ms. Tolles was charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud over a period of seven years. The information alleged that she misappropriated to her personal use money from bankruptcy estates, receiverships, and other matters by writing unauthorized checks from fiduciary accounts for those matters. The information further alleged that she had misappropriated about $16 million in at least resulting in at least a $2.4 million of losses to affected fiduciary matters. She pled guilty to those uh, charges and was sentenced to 81 months in prison, three years of supervised release, in order to pay $2.4 million in restitution. Now, um, going to Louisiana, uh, there was an attorney who had been practicing for about 20 years uh, by the name of Glay Collier. Uh, Mr. Collier's practice was largely representing Chapter 13 debtors, and um, he filed numerous Chapter 13 cases every year, hundreds if not thousands. In the Western District of Louisiana, there was a standing order that authorized Chapter 13 attorneys to opt to take a no-look fee that was not to exceed $2,800, so they wouldn't have had to file a fee application. They would take this no-look fee as their compensation. And the no-look fee was to include all pre-confirmation -con pre fees and advances made for expenses and filing fees. So in 479 cases, Mr. Collier would, on his the disclosure of compensation form, uh, in the SOFA, in the Chapter 13 plan, attest that he got paid the no-look fee and only the no-look fee, or he was going to get paid in total, the no-look fee. Unfortunately for Mr. Collier, he failed to disclose that he also charged those 479 debtors the $281 filing fee in each case, each of them. And he accepted that filing fee in cash, by money order, or ACH debits to their accounts. So Mr. Collier was charged with bankruptcy fraud in October of 2015. He pled guilty and the court held a sentencing hearing in April 2016. At the sentencing hearing, the court enhanced the sentence from the guidelines because they saw what the, the court saw that the intended loss was about $155,000. That was the loss at issue, and he enhanced the sentence and sentenced Mr. Collier to 34 months in prison, three years of supervised release, and ordered him to pay $69,000 in restitution. Although Mr. Collier pled guilty, he appealed his sentence, and that was recently affirmed on appeal. So these, these few bankruptcy um, fraud cases that I've described to you um, involve debtors, involve bankruptcy lawyers, involve forensic accountants, involve Chapter 7 trustees. Um, you know, it's a problem that occurs to all of the constituents in a bankruptcy case from time to time. Um, one of the other um, things that I'll mention, there are, there are a number of cases where parties make improper use of the automatic stay. And a lot of these cases occurred with the foreclosure crisis uh, and the real estate crisis that we all went through from 2008 to 2010, perhaps. Uh, in one case, there was a short sale scheme that a broker employed that um, he basically targeted distressed homeowners facing foreclosure and promised to save their homes. So he would cause to be filed fraudulent bankruptcies on the homeowner's behalf. behalf. Uh, and during the automatic stay period, he would negotiate a short sale of the property where he would earn a commission for, for getting the property sold through a short sale. He was indicted uh, and convicted of bankruptcy fraud. In another case, it was a Tampa case, um, this individual had a uh, foreclosure rescue scheme where he would obtain title from homeowners facing foreclosure, have the homeowners pay him rent 
during the process. The rent wouldn't be remitted um, to to the, the, the lenders, and um, he would, there would be fraudulent bankruptcies filed in those situations as well. Um, he went to prison for three years, not not long ago, and and there's a, a host of, of other cases um, as you can imagine involving uh, bankruptcy fraud and different variations of bankruptcy fraud. But it's a very serious problem that threatens the integrity of the bankruptcy system. With regard to the obligation to refer suspected bankruptcy fraud, the U.S. trustee program has a statutory obligation to refer matters to the appropriate U.S. attorney relating to the occurrence of any action which may constitute a crime and assist the U.S. Attorney in carrying out any prosecutions based on that action. Judges, receivers, and trustees also have a statutory obligation to report the underlying facts and circumstances to the appropriate U.S. Attorney, including the names of all witnesses and offenses suspected where they have reasonable grounds to believe that a violation of bankruptcy law has occurred. Now, where do these referrals go? There are what's referred to as bankruptcy fraud working groups that are made up of representatives of the U.S. Trustee's Office, representatives of the U.S. Attorney's Office, and several federal law enforcement agencies. And they go through these referrals periodically to discuss the referrals and determine which ones are worthy of, of pursuing through prosecution. What, what's the message in all of this? You know, I, if I had to sort of distill it to a message, I would say that we are each responsible for ensuring the integrity of the bankruptcy system and the public's confidence in the system. You know, we should, in my opinion, do whatever is necessary to ensure that the playing field on which we practice is level. Uh, as I was preparing for this presentation, I was thinking about you know, in the, the, the integrity of a game in professional sports or in, in amateur sports, and they always talk about the integrity of the game. Very different, obviously, than bankruptcy fraud. Bankruptcy is much more serious, but, you know, um, imagine, Mr. Johnson, your Florida Gators, if you knew a ref... If Wait you, a minute, that's <laughs> happened like that, hasn't it? <laughs> so, but imagine a referee who is taking money, a bribe, to make a call at a critical point in the game that will affect the outcome of the game. I mean, that affects the integrity of the game, or a player that is it drops the ball as they're going to score in the end zone, you know, because they're getting money, they're corrupt influences. None of us would probably watch that game, go to that game, if we think the fix is in, if it's fixed. It's the same thing applies to the bankruptcy world. If we are not uh, vigilant in making sure that we are on a level playing field and that play, people play by the rules of the game, it could negatively impact our, our profession. So that's the message that I have. Uh, but I welcome any questions that you have about the presentation. No questions, then I will turn over to Mike. Okay, my turn. And I want to thank Bob for that presentation. That was really great. Amazing that people that are on reality television shows that show off how much money they have would file bankruptcy and then not make disclosures. Really amazing. Um, I want to echo Bob's remarks. I think everybody survived the storms pretty well, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I know you all are, too. I know that Fort Myers and Naples was really hit hard, and that was, uh, I'm sure, a difficult uh, couple of days, and if not a couple of weeks. Uh, for the most part, I really saw attorneys cooperating with each other with respect to extensions of time to respond to things and things like that. And uh, I think the court tried to act pretty proactively um, you know, to deal with, to deal with situations. Um, as a matter of fact, I canceled the Thursday before the hurricane hit. I canceled all of our hearings before the district court decided that it was going to close the courthouse. But the district court's concerns are a little different than our concerns. The district court doesn't have as many people, members of the public, coming in for hearings. And so since public schools were already closed uh, down here, it seemed to me that it made a lot of sense. But anyway, hopefully we'll all get, you know, past that situation. Um, just a couple of quick reminders before I get into the, the meat of my presentation here today. Um, one is View from the Bench, November 2nd in uh, Tampa. Hope that many of you will come up. I hope you'll enjoy it. 
Uh, the PASCA seminar is going to be January 18th and 19th in Tampa, and I hope you all will consider coming up. It's kind of an expensive um, program to go to, but when you think how many hours of CLE credit you get, it's really very cost effective. So I hope that you'll think, I hope that you'll think about coming up. Um, I'm going to talk about four things today. Um, one is the attorney's fee order, which I think I talked about a little bit last month. Um, the other is uh, new procedures regarding the trustees' motions to dismiss in Chapter 13s, uh, a little revision to the administrative order governing procedures in Chapter 13s, and then I want to run through the plan. So when I asked uh, Brian if I could have a few moments to run through this, and I told him I could sort of do this in 15 minutes, I think I was consciously or unconsciously lying, uh, because uh, the trustees in Tampa just had a trustees nuts and bolts seminar on Friday, and I was up there for an hour and a half, so I'll try and, and move as quickly as I can through all this. So the first thing I just want to mention is the new procedure regarding the trustees' motions to dismiss. And um, this was something that came about out of discussions between the judges and the trustees and also because of a difference in um, procedures in Orlando and Jacksonville and Tampa and Fort Myers. So as you all know, when the debtor misses uh, two plan payments, the trustee will file a motion to dismiss. The court then automatically enters an order reserving ruling on that motion to dismiss that requires the debtor to make the, new, the next two plan payments on time and to cure with the third plan payment. That order also provided that if there was a future default, the trustee could submit an order dismissing the case. And what happened was a lot of cases were being dismissed, and then debtor's attorneys would run in on a motion for reconsideration or to vacate that dismissal order. And we have a lot of cases ping-ponging in and out of dismissed status and being reopened. That is not the way um, things have been handled in Orlando and in Jacksonville. Um, the judges were a little concerned, Tampa and myself, um, concerned about uh, the fact that someone could have some hiccups early on in a case and default and then an order reserving ruling is made and then they end up curing the default and then a year later they might default and then the trustee would submit an order dismissing the case sort of out of the blue. So part and parcel of the new fee structure um, and, and the monitoring fee that's going to be authorized to be paid to attorneys, part and parcel of that is that um, we're, we're not going to allow those automatic dismissals for a subsequent default. So if the, de if the debtor has cured the original default, the debtor's back on track. If the debtor defaults again, the trustee will give 14 days notice to cure the default. If the default is not cured, then the case will be dismissed. But that 14-day period gives you time to get a hold of your debtor, see if they need to file a motion to abate, see what's going on in the case, see if they have a basis to stay in the case. The flip side of that coin is that um, I and the other judges are not going to be uh, quite as flexible on reinstating cases that have been dismissed. So in other words, we're going to look to you all to deal with these things before the case gets dismissed rather than after the case gets dismissed. Now, that said, I will tell you, I think all of the judges are a little more flexible um, and generous when it comes to reinstating cases if the creditors that are being paid in the case are the IRS or domestic support obligation and unsecured creditors. Where we're less flexible is when the debtor is making adequate protection payments you know, to secure creditors through the plan because then the debtor just gets behind. And what we've sold the creditors on is um, this concept of don't file motions for relief from stay. The court is going to be monitoring payments for you. So anyway, that procedure is going to be in effect for all cases, even though um, prior admin orders provided for um, you know the, the way that we're handling it now, but that procedure will apply to all cases. So just kind of keep that in mind if you get a 14-day notice um, from the trustee's office that your client has defaulted in a payment that you need to be proactive and deal with it on the front end rather than on the back end. Okay, um, you all know about the fee order that um, has gone into effect September with cases filed after September 15th. So it's going to take us five years to work through the old cases that were filed September 14th and September 10th under the old fee structure. But hopefully the new fee structure, um, you know, will work for everyone. And please, um, if you want to interrupt me at any time during this presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask questions. But uh, I think I covered that pretty much last month, so I don't think there should be too much confusion on that. Uh, the, one, uh, the one substantive change that was made to the administrative order governing uh, 
uh, chapter 13 procedures and chapter 13 cases is that it now authorizes the pre-confirmation distribution by the chapter 13 trustee of out-of-crit protection payments uh, to lessors. So if you have a lease car that's being paid through the plan or if the debtor is paying rent um, through the plan, then those pre-confirmation adequate protection payments can be distributed by the trustees. And if you think about it, that really makes sense, particularly in light of the, um, the uh, Supreme Court case that said that when the case gets dismissed, any money the trustee's holding has to go back to the debtor. And you, know, you might have a debtor that you know, has been in a Chapter 13 for a while, um, not yet confirmed, but yet is making car payments through the plan or something like that. So that seemed as though that was something that would be fair. Okay, so um, last week, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Kelly Remick, who you all think of as Kelly Ballard, I know, but Kelly Remick and John Waggy hosted a, a nuts and bolts seminar, and their staff, um, staff attorneys were there, Michael Cecil was there as well, and, and chimed in on a number of things. And I had the uh, privilege of presenting on the model plan. So I'm going to just sort of kind of run through it pretty quickly. I know one question that's come up is, um, that we have this model plan, it's now a district-wide plan required throughout the district, and it's really dictated by new bankruptcy um, uh, rule uh, 3015 and 3015-1, which has allowed our district to opt out of the official form plan. Um, and the question has arisen, why are we um, making that required now rather than December 1? Well, once we have it up and running, we want to start using it. That's number one. Uh, number two, the language of the new revised model plan accommodates the new Chapter 13 fee structure. So the sooner we get that in place, the sooner lawyers can start working under the new fee structure. Um, I will say that right now, um, the judges look to the Chapter 13 trustees to um, to monitor the plans to make sure that they are that the correct form of model plan is being used and to file the appropriate mod motion to dismiss if one isn't being used. Um, this plan, I think the trustees are all in agreement, has sort of a soft landing. If you use the old plan form, nobody's going to um, dismiss your case or you know give you notice. You'll probably get, get along with it. But I think that uh, if you want to use the new fee structure and you want that $50 a month monitoring fee, you're going to want to use the new plan form. The other thing that I mentioned last month is that we were working on creating a fillable PDF with collapsible sections so that if you had class of classes of creditors that um, did not apply to your debtor, such as if your debtor had no priority claims, if your debtor had no domestic support obligations, if your debtor had no secured claims, you can you know check the box that says none, that whole section will collapse up. If you ended up having 10 secured creditors and you needed to add additional sections to cover those 10 secured creditors, you can add them. Um, that is something that we're still working on. Our IT staff is working on it now. I hope that it will be rolled out pretty soon, um, but I think that will be really great. It will be a fillable PDF that you can save as a draft. Um, yes, Richard, you have a question? Have some of the vendors that have um, document prep programs taken the new... Uh, I, I don't know because I, can, I only work on the front end. I don't do the back office stuff. So eventually I'm sure it will work it'll work their way down to them. Um, but what I wanted to mention is, and I, and I ran this by... Uh, uh, Kelly and John uh, at the seminar. Uh, the form that is now on the court's website is a Word document. There is no problem with your collapsing a section in that Word document. So in other words, if you have no priority claims, type in after that heading none and then delete the rest of that section and then move to the next section. Um, the advantage to that, both when it's a the fillable PDF and when, if you do this in the, using the Word document, is that if you had a Chapter 13 plan that is only paying um, attorney's fees, trustee's fees, and unsecured creditors, you will end up with a two-page plan instead of a nine-page plan. So it will save a lot of paper if, if you collapse those sections, and there's no problem with that. What is important is that you type the word none next to the heading of any section that is not applicable to your particular debtor. And the other thing that is important is that when you um, create a plan for a client, that you go back to the original form and don't work off of somebody else's, you know, don't, don't modify someone else's plan. Because if you do that, you're going to forget a section and then there's going to be a problem. Okay? So very important, um, you know, if you decide to, you know, cross out or delete portions of the, 
of um, our model plan because they don't apply um, to make sure that you're working off of the original Word document so that you don't um, you don't miss any sections. So that's kind of the general remarks. So let's get going here. I'm going to try and fly through this um, as quickly as possible. So this is the model plan district wide in the fifth, um, September 15th. That's nothing new. Um, notices. I'm just going to run through the contents of the plan. This um, first section of the plan notices. This is all required by Rule 3015-1, and you have to check. Uh, one box and one box only on each of those sections. So essentially that this form is, or this provision of the form, is designed to alert creditors as to what they need to be looking for in the plan. So if you're going to value property, um, so that would be the first, the first box is really a, um, a strip down or a strip off. Uh, if you're going to avoid a judicial lien, um, then you need to check the box, appropriate box, and if you have any non-standard provisions, you need to check. You need to check that box as well. If you check no boxes, then any non-standard provisions, any lien avoidance, any valuation provisions are not applicable. If you check both boxes, any any of those um, sections will not be applicable. So you need to make sure that you check the right box. Uh, next section: monthly plan payments. Um, this uh, is exactly the same as what's in the current plan. If you um, are filing your plan right out the door, um, you know, right when you first file the case, uh, you should be filing most commonly a plan that provides for equal monthly payments through the 36 or 60 month period of the plan. And you might only need that first line. Um, if you're filing an amended plan and there have been adjusted to the plan payments, then obviously you're going to need the additional lines. Uh, proposed distributions, first to administrative attorney's fees. This is the provision that I was talking about that's going to, um, oops, sorry about that, that's um, going to provide for your monthly monitoring fee. So uh, generally speaking, this is what you're going to do. Your base fee is going to be $4,500. You're going to subtract from that whatever your retainer is. That's your balance due. If you have, um, if you're anticipating MMM fees, go ahead and put them in up front. That way, it's right in the plan to begin with. You're calculating your plan payments based on your mortgage modification mediation fees. Um, the estimated monitoring fee, you're pretty safe if you start estimating that at, I think it's right, no, it's not there, um, at month seven, of, month seven of the plan. So your goal ought to be to try to get the plan confirmed in the first six months, and then that monitoring fee start in month seven. But that's going to be adjustment. That's going to be adjusted. So then that final line, attorney's fees payable through the plan at X dollars monthly, um, it's still subject to that, I think it's $450 a month cap, but that should um, cover it. Yes? $550. 550 Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. You can see I don't receive those payments, so I don't pay attention to that. Okay. Anyway, um, all those fees obviously subject to adjustment, but um, you know that's what you're going to want to fill in. The reason why we don't spell out $50 a month um, right there in the form is because in Jacksonville they only pay twenty-five dollars a month. So that was, you know, that was the concession so that this form could be used uh, district-wide. Okay. So then, separate sections for do, uh, domestic support obligations and priority claims. Again, if you don't have them, you could write in none. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, paragraph five A versus paragraph five B. Okay. Under um, Rule thirty fifteen dash one, don't. Point one, don't even ask me why. Uh, claims that are secured by the debtor's principal residence, which the debtor intends to retain and cure arrear just through the plan, have to be in a separate paragraph. I don't know why. So 5A is for the debtor's principal residence, 5B is for other real property, um, 5B real pro other real property secured claims. So you can just kind of, I don't know if you can read that, but they basically are the same. Um, I should have mentioned, you know, we had posted this for public comment. We got a lot of public comments. Some of you all sent comments in. I hope that you all have received a letter from me responding to what, responding to your comments and whether we made a revision to the plan. One of the comments that we received was that there wasn't a, um, as a form as we originally posted it, um, didn't provide for the cure of HOA or condo association dues and wanted to make that clear. So you can put HOA and condo association dues in these sections. You know that you're required if the debtor is curing arrears to pay um, the regular mortgage payment through the plan. You're not required to pay post-petition HOA or condo associations uh, through the plan, uh, but you can if you want to. So you can put that in there um, if you want to. Uh, gap payments. 
Um, I never, I never see any gap payments. But sometimes there's some lawyers they just want to make sure that there's a little extra cushion there in, uh, in case there's some changes in the mortgage payments or something during the current during the plan. Um, and so there's a sp there's a space in there for gap payments. So if you want to use it, um, you can do it. But I don't pretend to understand that. Okay. Um, that's an extra mortgage payment to close the gap. That just sort of explains it. And let me also tell you that um, Kelly Remick has made some revisions to the slides, and when she's completed the process, because I'm only going to give you half the presentation that was given at the, at the seminar last week, or less than half, um, when she's completed that process, we'll have it emailed out to everybody, so you've got the, the benefit of having this. I should have said that in case you were worried about taking notes. Okay, so if you want to... Um, modify a mortgage, you're still required to pay the, more, the modified mortgage payments through the plan, even post-confirmation. Um, paragraph 5D deals with personal and real property where the plan seeks to value the property. So this is if you're going to strip down property. Um, obviously, the debtor's principal residence, you're not going to strip down, but uh, other property you might be able to strip down to the value of the property. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, one question that came up is, is if the, the new bankruptcy rules say that you can um, value property or strip down or strip off, that you can do that by motion, you can do that in the plan, or you can do that by claim objection. Some people say, well, why can't we just pick and choose what we're doing? Because the judges in the middle district want you to do it by motion. And all I can say is count yourself lucky. Somehow we've got these plans, all these forms through Jacksonville, but in Jacksonville they require an adversary proceeding. I hope they're not going to still continue to require an adversary proceeding. But we are requiring that a separate motion be filed. We think that's better notice to the creditor. Also allows you to get an order to, that you include the legal description on, gives you a document that can be recorded, um, seems to me is much better than a confirmation order that might not address all those issues. Uh, let's see. Um, so under 3015-1, if you have a 910 car, or a secure debt that was incurred within a year prior to the filing of the bankruptcy case, um, secure by purchase money security interest, you're not allowed to modify it um, in a plan. You have to put it in a separate paragraph, and uh, so that's what this paragraph is for, paragraph 5F, and I think you can still tweak the interest rate if you want to, so you can go ahead and do that, but the, but the balance of the loan has to be paid through the plan. Uh, let's see, 5G is if you want to pay the full amount of a secured claim for real or personal property. So when would you want to do that? Let's say you owe, your client owes, you know, $2,000 on a car and the payments are $500 a month, but to make the plan work, it works out better for your client to stretch that $2,000 out over five years. Now, I have to say, you really have to think about that in doing that because that, is that in your client's best interest? Because if the case gets dismissed, then your client's in default on the car loan, the client might be better off paying off the loan sooner rather than later. But, you know, that's an extreme example. What if you had a client that owed three years of car payments and you could stretch it out to five and it just seemed like it made more sense and by the time they got to the third year, you'd know whether they were going to be able to do it or not. Uh, let's see. 5H is, um, oh, you want, to you want to maintain the regular payments and cure arrears through the plan. So, for example, you have a car, your client's $1,000 behind, your client wants to make the regular car payments and cure the $1,000. To me, you'd almost always want to value the car, but, you know, maybe the car's worth more than the debt, and so this is the best way of handling that. Uh, secure claims paid directly by the debtor, this is the same um, provision that we had in the most recent uh, version of the plan. The automatic stay is going to terminate in rem as to the debtor and in rem and in, and in personam as to co-debtors. So that's um, the same provision we had. Debtors, uh, 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 state law contract rights are not terminated. Um, you all may know that um, Richard just argued the, um, the Mildred Dukes case up before the 11th Circuit, which is the discharge issue. The plan was drafted specifically not to address these discharge issues, but that would be an issue that might come up. Is this a, is, would this debt be a, be a debt that was provided for under the plan such that it would um, be included in the discharge under 1328? So that's something you just you might want to think about. The other thing you might want to think about is an interesting issue. I spoke at um, the NACBA conference <laughs> last spring, 
and I started talking about this issue of whether a debt that's being paid direct is provided for under the plan. And it was very interesting. The other judges on the panel had no idea what I was talking about. What they thought I was talking about was this new concept that if the debtor's plan provides that the debtor is going to make post-petition payments directly to the creditor, and the debtor doesn't do that, then maybe the debtor doesn't get a discharge. I'm just like stunned by that. But that's evidently a, something that's going on throughout the country. Hasn't really been an issue for us yet. Okay, um, this is just, uh, oh, it talks about the Duke's case and the, and the discharge issue. So you, you'll get that slide, you can read that. Surrender, obviously if the debtor's surrendering, then the stay is terminated um, in rem and in persona as to, as to co-debtors and in rem as to the debtor. Uh, 5K, so this is the provision that was inserted into the plan maybe a year or so ago, or maybe a year and a half ago. This is where you have a client that's not going to make any payments under the plan, never intends to make a payment under the plan, but the debtor wants to go ahead and defend that state court um, foreclosure, and this is to prevent the debtor from selecting the surrender option and then having um, a state court or the 11th Circuit um, say, when well, you chose surrender, you have to surrender. Speaking of the surrender option, you all are probably aware of the recent 11th Circuit case. It just came out, I think, the 18th. It was a Slater case. It's a case that discusses judicial estoppel in the context of a, a debtor, you know, it comes up all the time. Debtor fails to, fails to um, uh, assert a pre-petition employment discrimination claim on his or her bankruptcy schedules. Then the defendant employer, when the case is discharged or dismissed or whatever, um, says that the debtor shouldn't be allowed to pursue that state court or district or federal district court claim because of uh, judicial estoppel principles. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the the surrender case, and I'm just forgetting the name, the 11th Circuit surrender case, it's just, yeah. huh? Faiea, that's right, I call it the Faiea case, Faiea. Anyway, the Faiea case never once used the word judicial estoppel, but that's what the case was, was a judicial estoppel case. So um, that's just something, um, you know, to, to, kind of, to kind of think of there, and maybe when you're dealing with those Faiea fact patterns, you might want to think about the Slater language, which Slater says the issue is whether the um, debtor intended to make a mockery of the judicial system, which is always a fact-intensive inquiry. So, so very, very interesting. And just so you know, that was an en banc decision of the 11th Circuit. We have Judge Choflat to thank for it because um, when he was on the original panel, he wrote about a 35-page consenting, I mean, not consenting, concurring opinion saying we need to address this situation. So I thought that was interesting. Um, judge Choflat, big, you know, proponent of the bankruptcy system and the bankruptcy judges and um, I think about 80-something, I don't know, five years old, and still working hard. Okay, um, changes to the uh, admin order, that, that's what I already talked about, about payments for leases and executory contracts being paid uh, pre-confirmation. Uh, pre and there's now a more detailed provision in the plan for leases and executory contracts. We kind of realized when we went through the plan, it's like if you had an executory contract, you had to, um, you had to uh, 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 what do you do? You reject or you assume? Okay, you had to assume it in one place, but then you had to treat it someplace else, and it was very, very confusing. So now we have three options. So the first option is if you're going to cure arrearages through the plan, and you have to provide for prompt cure of pre-petition arrearages. I'll also, if you look in the, the first paragraph there, that last sentence says, if debtors' payments under the plan are timely paid, payments to creditors' lessors under the plan shall be deemed contractually paid on time. So that is something to think about, um, especially you know if you're creditors' counsel, you want to realize that you have to advise your clients that if the debtors making the plan payments on time, it counts um, it counts as a timely made payment even if the creditor doesn't get it within the contractual time period. And that brings me back, this is the explanation for the gap payment. Let's say you pay, your, your client files bankruptcy on September 25th and there's a mortgage payment due on October 1st, but your client's first plan payment isn't going to be until October 25th. Your client's late on that mortgage payment and if you stuck in a gap payment um, under the treatment of the mortgage claim, that would, that would resolve that issue. Okay, so this, this paragraph is if you're going to assume the contract and you're going to cure arrearages through the plan, you have to t you have to promptly cure the arrearages. And that, of course, is an issue of fact and, you know, that will depend on, on uh, you know, position that the creditor takes and what the judge ultimately decides. 
Then the creditors, can, excuse me, debtors can also assume leases and executory contracts and pay direct, again with the automatic stay being terminated. And then lastly, if the debtor wants to reject, then the debtor is going to reject and is going to surrender the property. And then uh, the provision for unsecured creditors remains the same. And the general plan provisions uh, remain the same. Uh, there are a lot of comments about the tax refunds and the responses. Got to turn those tax refunds over. Uh, I think that I think the new system now, where the trustee, you don't have to get an order modifying the plan necessarily. You just have to work something out with the trustee, and if you can't work it out, then you can file a motion. I think that's working pretty well. There was also a question about debtors who weren't getting their earned income credit, and the trustees' response is pretty uniform. And I mean, by uniform, I mean throughout the district, um, they usually just work it out with the debtors and let the debtors get the EIC back. And then uh, non-standard provisions. So what's an example of a non-standard provision? I'll give you a couple good ones. Um, one is student loans. That was another question. What about what if you have a student loan um, that is being dealt with outside the plan because your client, uh, now I'm forgetting what the technical terms are, like it's an income-based something plan, so you know your client's paying next to nothing or nothing because their income is so low. Or what if the payments, the client doesn't have to make student loan payments or there's some forgiveness program because they're doing some sort of public service, okay? Well, then you would include that in, the, in this non-standard provisions. You just sort of spell that out right there. And generally speaking, I know there's some arguments being made that you can separately classify student loans um, or non -discharge, other non-dischargeable debts, but generally speaking, um, the case law is pretty much that you can't separately classify them. You know, the debtor's just stuck. But you don't want to have your debtor in a worse position with respect to a student loan after a Chapter 13 than they were going into the Chapter 13. And I think what judges are going to look at is, are the student loans being paid more through the Chapter 13 than other unsecured creditors are being paid? But if your client's got a deal going, you know, then, that, then that's really great. Uh, another uh, good idea for something that would belong um, in this uh, non-standard provision section would be a reverse mortgage. So let's say you know your client has a reverse mortgage, they're getting a check for a thousand bucks a month or 500 bucks a month, but they're obligated to maintain current taxes and insurance. You'd want to throw that in there. If they had taxes and insurance, let's say the reverse mortgage had, um, had uh, made an advance for um, taxes and insurance. Well, you might want to put it there or you might want to, you know, put it up in the home in, in the uh, home mortgage section and but spell it out as to exactly what's going to happen because no one's going to understand why your client's not making regular payments on the reverse mortgage. Uh, also if you had a, a potential claim, your client had a lawsuit, the proceeds were going to be committed to the plan, that, uh, that would belong there. So just anything that doesn't fit in the box and we got some suggestions for other you know categories of types of things that could be included in the plan and we just kind of had to draw the line at some point. You know, you might have a client that has a very specific issue going on, um, but then that belongs in the non-standard provisions. And then um, lastly, the certification, and there was a question raised, why does the attorney have to certify that the plan is consistent with the model plan? Well, there's two reasons. One reason is because, well, you drafted it, <laughs> so if you can't certify it, who can? That's number one. And number two is because 3015.1 requires that the attorney or the debtor, if the debtor is not, um, is not represented by counsel, actually do a certification. So I don't know what the consequences of making a false certification are or a negligently you know, false um, certification. I guess we'll have to see how that develops in the case law. And that's basically the plan. I covered the attorney's fees and costs, so I think we're pretty much there. Um, one thing you all are going to be interested in um, is maybe you're going to think uh, uh, you're going to have a very complex mortgage modification mediation, so $2,500, but the standard MMM fee is $1,800 unless you've really got an exceptionally, um, an exceptionally uh, complex one. And the language that we're really looking for in deciding whether there's additional um, additional fees where you file a fee application is if there were extraordinary services. So if you're defending an adversary proceeding, if you're you know, prosecuting a, a big objection to an IRS claim and it, you know, it turns out to be and it turns out to be very time consuming, that's that's an extraordinary service. But just run in the mail objections to claims, motions to strip, all that kind of stuff, um, that that will be included in the forty five hundred dollar um, uh, reasonably presumptively reasonable fee. 
and in the uh, and in the fifty dollar a month monitoring fee. Yes. If we have extraordinary services, we just need to apply for those services. Right, right. You would just apply for those services. That's right. But you know, the, the theory behind the presumptively reasonable fee is that you're going to make money on some cases and lose money on ca some cases. And I have to tell you, I have a very skewed. And I'm sorry for keeping y'all late. And any of you need to load, go. It will not hurt my feelings. Um, the um, I have a skewed perspective because when I take the bench, all I see are these nightmare cases that have been going on for a year, two years. And, you know, every time I look at them, I'm like, man, the lawyer's not making any money on this case. You've been to court 18 times. You know, you're not making any money on this case at all. But every once in a while, I'll pull up a case for, some, you know, for some reason, and I'll just be like thrilled. My God, the confirmation order was docket number 18. <laughs> I never even saw the case, you know. Well, that's a case you made money on, Okay. Now, I will also say, and there is language in the attorney's fee order that says this, just because there are presumptively reasonable fees doesn't mean you need to charge a presumptively reasonable fee. You have somebody come in your office, it's, look, it's going to be a very clean case, it's going to be very easy, particularly if you know, they don't have a lot of money. You know, if, if you look at it and you say, man, I can do this case for $3,500 or $3,600, I, I, I ask you please, do it for $3,500 or $3,600 or $2,500, something like that. And the other um, point that I wanted to make I wanted to make clear was um, absent extraordinary postage and, 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 and copying expenses, um, those are included basically in the $50 a month monitoring fee. So we're not anticipating additional awards for postage and photocopying. And let's see, oh, this is, this is explaining calculating the attorney's fees started at month seven. So that means that'd be an extra $2,700 that you would plug into your case, um, in, into your fee section. For the monitoring fees, yes. What is the extra fifty dollars start? Confirmation. Well, confirmation can be two years. Well, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. We don't necessarily have choice. Don't, don't do that. Okay. So you know there are times when you have to when you have to file a case on an emergency basis. A client comes to you the day before a foreclosure sale. You've got to get it on file. But this was really an, an interesting point that uh, that Kelly and John made at the seminar. It was really really interesting. Before the case is filed, your client has every incentive to get you every piece of paper and every piece of information that you need to handle their case. Once they've gotten the protection of the automatic stay, it's, it's, not, it, it's dropped off their radar screen. I mean, I'm generalizing here, of course, but they don't have the same um, sense of urgency, okay? So, you know, you can, you can figure out what the, um, you know, what, the, what the default is on the mortgage. You know, you can get a mortgage statement. You can ask for a, more, a, a payoff demand. You can figure that out. You can run a credit report. You can get it, you know, you need to do a lien strip. You can get a BPO. You know, you can, you can do a lot of that work up front. Yes? Um, before I send my father off to state court, I got a question about the surrender on this automatic stay. Yes. I need to educate my state judges, and one of the judges that he's about to go in front of is, I've just got so much room in the hard drive. So before we use up some of that room, um, the administrative order is very clear that if they surrender the property, the state is not there. Do I need to put that in my senior judge's hard drive, or is that something that's going to be readdressed every time we have a changeover? Because I would like to have that addressed in their mind, because they're very frightened of bankruptcy judges. That, that, is, that has been in the administrative order for a couple of years now. It's been in the plan for a couple of years now. Sometimes they still want a comfort order because they're afraid. Okay, um, I, I would say where I have seen problems with state court judges is, um, and we had a horrible problem, still do, with a judge in Pinellas County. I mean, he does not believe, you know, like, husband files, case gets dismissed. Wife files, case is 30 days old. Oh, my goodness, no stay in effect. Let's the sale, let's the sale go forward. No, won't, won't continue a sale. Refuses to continue a sale. You know, both creditor and debtor asked to continue the sale. Guess what? Third party bids. Nightmare, nightmare. I think we've done a lot of education there. Okay, um, but if you have a plan and it says surrender, you know, maybe what you, want to, maybe what you want to be able to give the state court judge is a couple of things. One, you want to give them the plan. Two, you want to give them the docket so they can see there hasn't been an amended plan file. And three, you want to give them the admin order. And the plan itself says the state's not in effect. 
Okay, and I think that the debtor bar is, is very well educated and, and jumping on this right away. You have a client that wants to surrender their car and two months later they change their mind and now they want to keep the car, you've got to come in on a motion to impose the automatic stay and I think everybody's doing that really well. I think everybody is coming in right away on motions to extend the stay in second filings or to impose the, fi the stay in third filings. I think you all are doing, are doing a great job with that. I mean those just come up, you know, just come up very routinely. But, but yeah, Richard, the $50 starts post-confirmation incentive to get you to confirmation. Well, that, we don't necessarily get the option of, or the luxury of saying we're gonna be able to get it done in seven months. Because, you know, you've already calculated that it's gonna be seven months. Why couldn't we say that it would start at that point and then once it, it gets, doesn't get paid until confirmation? Well, you know what, why don't you see how this plays out? Okay, and then, you know, then present some statistics to the, you know, you know what I mean? In other words, if the bar says, wait a second, we should really start this at month seven, no matter what. I mean, that's the Jacksonville theory. They get 25, they don't have to wait till confirmation. They get $25 a month for the whole case. But they're only getting $25 a month. You're getting $2,700. You know, that ought to cover a lot of post-confirmation motions. See, think about it. I'm not disagreeing with yeah. you. Yeah, and that, and that, oh. And, right. The problem is, that we get stuck with cases that require things to be done, documents to get there, tax returns to be finished, whatever it is. And we don't control, as lawyers, the privilege of saying this could be done in nine months or seven months or 15 months. I bet you have more control than you think you do, okay? Uh -huh. So uh, what I'm saying is keep track of those cases, okay? My office presses pretty, pretty hard. Keep so track I'm of those cases, okay? And then, and then you'll have a pitch to make. But this is this is the this is the rule for now. Okay. All right. And then disclosure. This is an, in, in the in the materials are a form of disclosure. Um, although I don't really like this disclosure. It, at the at the end, it says fifty dollars a month for monitoring. Um, to be, I would put that up on the first line. But okay, as long as it's there somewhere. Yes. One other one. Does this fifty dollars apply whether or not it's filed before or after the? No, effective September 15th. And so that's why I said we're going to have, for five years, we're going to have to juggle these two systems, okay? And then examination of attorney's fees. Oh, you know, this is always the rule. Any party can request um, an examination of attorney's fees or disgorgement of fees. And if the trustee doesn't think the lawyer's working to, inc to earn that $50 a month, in other words, when you have you know debtors calling the trustee saying my client told me to call the trustee or you know you've got problems with things the trustees may you know take some action there but that would be obviously reviewed by the court and you want to make sure that everywhere in your plan your plan your financial disclosures your sofa you want to make sure all those numbers are consistent and then that's it um, the, the changes to the bankruptcy rules, the, the, the main one I think that um, really is going to apply to us, first of all, it's the 3015 and the 3015.1. Okay. Um, there's also a revision to the rules. It shortened the time for filing proofs of claim. File, shortened it, I think, from 90 days to 70 days. So that helps a little bit um, on uh, doing valuations and things like that. And uh, secure creditors are now required to file proofs of claim, but they don't lose their security interest if they don't file proofs of claim. So I have no idea what that means. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Anyway, that's that's basically um, the presentation after I finished this section and ran through the rules changes and I just gave you the, the main highlights. Um, uh, Kelly and John basically gave some practice pointers and practice tips on communicating with their offices and things like that. And when you get the PowerPoint, it'll all be in there. So thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing these new plans. And I'm excited to, to see if it facilitates the practice. Hopefully y'all will make a little bit more money and that would be, I'm sure, a good thing from your perspective. Okay?